day of faith. Thank you so much for having me, Father. So Father won't, t- won't tell you this, but he's been my spiritual director for about seven years since I started seminary here at St. Mary's. So he's been a huge gift to me in my life, and I'm happy to come out and be with his community this evening. Is it better if I go to the middle, or I don't know what would be, what would be best here. We can sit here. Um, I'm going to take my mask off, if that's OK. These people here are comfortable. So as Father said, my name is David, Father David Michael Moses. Um, I know that is a mouthful. Um, I was actually Abigail in the womb for nine months. My mom was just convinced I was going to be a girl, even though she never had it tested. And so I came out, and she said, oh, Abigail, Abigail, you're a boy. And uh, so I was. I didn't have a name for three days. Um, Is this mic too loud? Is it okay? We're good? I didn't have a name for three days. Um, my, My... Dad always wanted a son named Michael, so he really wanted to name me Michael. But my mom had dated a guy in high school named Michael, and so she thought that if she named one of her sons that, and he heard about it, that he would think that she still was into him or something. And so she kept shooting that down. But finally, after three days, she said it was okay if they added David to it, and I just went by both all the time. So I always went by David and Michael growing up which was already long enough, and then when you add Father David Michael, it makes it even longer. I thought about going by Father Moses, my last name, Father Moses, but that sounds like I'm like 140 years old, which just does not, not fit my face. Um, I'm 27. I was uh, meeting with a guy the other day about a funeral for his, his mom, and he mentioned he had grandkids, and I said, well, wow, you don't look old enough to be a grandfather. He said, well, you don't look old enough to be a priest. So that is fair, fair point, um, well taken. So I've been a priest for about a year and a half now. Absolutely love it. Like Father Phil was saying, it is such, such a joy to be a priest. Um, if you've ever prayed for a general in, increase in vocations, uh, you did this. This is your fault uh, that I'm a priest now. And it's fun to be a, a young priest. Um, I like to write songs about different things, different aspects of priesthood. So I wrote this song about that. I'm not sure. We had a, some difficulty getting the sound to work. So I'm not sure. You guys can kind of hear that, huh? I don't know if it's, uh, hopefully the mic's not too loud compared to the guitar, but we'll do the best we can. I always wanted my own family a bunch of kids calling me daddy my wife and i we teach them about life show them the world and raise them right yeah i always wanted to be a dad but it turned out kind of different than the plans i had being a father there is not what I thought it'd be Because most of my kids are older than me That's right, most of my kids are older than me I teach my kids all about God We're eating lots of donuts, working on my dad bod Cause I'm the real deal, it's not a hoax I'm even telling dad jokes Yeah, I always wanted to be a dad But it turned out kind of different Than the plans I had Being a father is not what I thought it'd be Because most of my kids are older than me And some of my kids, well, they got kids too which I guess makes me a grandfather too. Yeah, I always wanted to be a granddad, but it turned out kind of different than the plans I had. Being a grandpa's not what I thought it'd be because some of my grandkids are still older than me. That's right, some of my grandkids are still older than me. Thank you, thank you. So being a, a father has been such a, such a gift. I am um, in my ordination a year and a half ago. It was before COVID, and I was thankful for that because the cathedral was just, was just packed. We had so many people. There were seven of us who got ordained, which is the most we've had in the archdiocese um, since 1986, uh, which is really cool. Is the microphone okay? Are we getting some feedback or anything? We're fine. Um, 
most of it has in 1986. There were seven of us, so the cathedral was just packed with, with people. And um, I remember coming in, they, they say your name, you come to the front, and then you turn around at one point for the congregation to offer their approval, essentially, and that's done usually by, by applause. So I turned around and I just looked at all the people, and there were so many priests and um, all my family and my friends and all these people in the archdiocese from different parishes that I've met. Um, and I just kind of felt the Lord say in that moment, um, you know, David and Michael, these, these are my people. These are my people, and, and I am a, uh, I'm a father for them. I'm a father for these people. And today, uh, they become your people, and, and you need to be a father for them, and you need to take care of them. Um, and I felt that really deeply on the day of my ordination, and I felt it really deeply, deeply since then. Even just earlier today, um, I was playing for the golf tournament for, for St. Faustina, where I'm from, and um, Knights of Columbus fundraiser, and I had to come back early for this. And uh, we were on the ninth hole, which was actually really far away from the clubhouse, so I needed a ride back. And right then, the, the girl with the, who was selling the drinks and everything, the drink cart pulled up, and my dad said, can you ride with you back to the clubhouse? And she said, yeah, sure. And we just had the most amazing conversation coming back about her life and what was going on. I ended up giving her a blessing at the end, and she was crying, and it's just amazing as a priest the moments I get to just experience and just get to witness um, in so many different capacities. So I'm so, so thankful for that. Um, I am from Clear Lake, kind of near Nassau, you know what that is, I'm the fifth of, of six kids. Um, it's fun to be the fifth one because by the time your parents have the fifth kid, they just don't care that much. And you kind of get to do whatever you want. I think a good example that illustrates that, when I was probably two, my older brother was holding me one day on the street and he dropped me and it was like a gravel road. And so I fell and my, my head hit the gravel and I got a, like a small rock stuck in my forehead. And um, so they, I, you know, I was bleeding and he brought me inside. And my mom you know, said she was gonna take me to the doctor but it was a busy day with everything going on. And so she didn't make it to the doctor until the next day. And at that point, the skin had already grown over the rock. And the doctor was like, just leave it, he's fine. And so I still to this day have a rock stuck in my head. Um, it's still there, you can feel it. And um, someone, I told that story to someone, someone the other day and they were like, oh, that's great. Wherever you go, you always have a piece of home. <laughs> it's like, oh, that's one way to kind of look at it. Um, but part of priesthood is, um, being celibate, that was the biggest point of discernment for me was the fact that for the rest of my life I wasn't gonna be able to, uh, to get married, right? That's a huge thing. When you're 18 years old going to seminary, that sounds kind of insane. Um, but one of the ways we understand celibacy is that you're married to the, kind of married to the church, married to the Catholic church. And so I, I wrote this song based on that. Was the guitar vocal mix okay on that last song? Was it too crazy? Um, we could try that. Or can I use that microphone Anyone on that can. side? Let's, let's give that a shot because it is a little bit um, getting some feedback here. So. Turn this off here. On here, testing. Okay. Getting kind of creative with it. Okay, does that sound a little bit better? Yes? Okay, good. You can kind of hear the guitar okay a little bit? Okay, maybe we can kind of get both in there a little bit. You can kind of hear me okay? Okay, good. I feel like we did all this for like a very silly song, but it's okay. You'll enjoy it. Well, Mom, I think I found the one for me. Might not be what you're expecting, but she'd agree That we got a real connection, only took six years to see And lots of spiritual direction, but she's the one for me The only problem is she's not from Texas And she's not like any of my exes She's kind of old, but I don't mind that She's kind of big, but not like that And I'm gonna live wherever she's at I give her my heart and I don't want it back She's not perfect, but her beauty is all I see. And if she's good enough for Jesus, she's good enough for me. I'm gonna love her all my life, give her everything she ever wanted. Just trying to be her trophy husband, yeah. Just wanna be her trophy husband, yeah. 
mom, I think I found the one for me. Things are going pretty steady. She's got good money. But a bunch of kids already. The family has a lot of work conditions. The marriage has a lot of work conditions. I cook all the meals and I do the dishes. The only problem is she's not from Texas and she's not like any of my exes. Cause she's kinda old, but I don't mind that. She's kinda big, but not like that. And I'm gonna live wherever she's at. I give her my heart and I don't want it back. She's not perfect, but her beauty is all I see. And if she's good enough for Jesus, she's good enough for me. I'm gonna love her all my life, give her everything she ever wanted. Just trying to be her trophy husband, yeah. Just wanna be her trophy husband, yeah. Truth is, the church isn't an abstract idea from a distant point of view. The church has a face, and it looks like every one of you. And you're kind of old, but I don't mind that. You're kind of big, but not like that. And I'm gonna live wherever you're at. I give you my heart, and I don't want it back. You're not perfect, but your beauty is all I see. And if you're good enough for Jesus, you're good enough for me. I'm gonna love you all my life, give you everything you ever wanted. Just trying to be your trophy husband, yeah. I just wanna be your trophy husband, yeah. So yes, um, let's talk about the triduum. I, yesterday we had Palm Sunday, right? Um, we have that long, long gospel, gospel reading. And uh, the thing that always strikes me the most out of, out of that reading is the little part where it says, they pressed into service Simon of Cyrene uh, to help carry the cross of Jesus. And I just think, you know, Jesus wasn't surprised by that, right? Like, he was God. It was all planned out. He knew someone was going to help carry him carry his cross. And so that was on purpose, right, that someone helped Jesus carry his cross. I think it's such a beautiful model for us because even Jesus had someone carry his cross. Like, even God needed someone to help him carry his cross. And so how much more should we, you know, be willing to carry the cross of others um, and be willing to let others carry our crosses with us. And the church kind of sets that tone for us going into this, this Holy Week. Um, and then tomorrow night, um, we'll have the Chrism Mass with the Archdiocese. And uh, that's where all the oils are blessed um, for the year, anointing, the anointing oils and the Chrism and all of that. And the priests renew their promises, um, usually on that mass and usually it's a either Tuesday night or Thursday morning of Holy Week and that's important the church wants her priests going into the triduum to be reaffirmed in what it is that they believe you know as they lead these people in worship and then of course we have Holy Thursday um, you know, coming up and the first thing that one of the first things that happens in Holy Thursday after the homily is the, the washing of the feet right and uh, you know what you often find I've talked to pastors is that you know the people who get selected to have their feet washed they um, often will get like pedicures, you know, they make sure that their feet are very, very immaculate so that the priest, you know, isn't offended by the smell or the look. And that's nice, you know, I'm glad people aren't just coming in with, you know, disgusting feet, not worried about it. But in a lot of ways, that kind of that misses the point. Um, a buddy of mine, a couple years ago, was at this parish, and for Holy, Holy Thursday, he decided to do an experiment. He went around that week to people's houses and asked if he could clean their toilets. He was knock on the door and be like, hey, can I clean your toilet? And people would often be like, either they would say just no, like there's no way, Father, I'm gonna let you clean the toilet. Or they would say like, yeah, you can clean like our guest bathroom toilet. Like we never use that one, it's clean. That'd be fine, you can clean that one, right? Only a couple people let him go into like their bedrooms and to their personal bathrooms and clean those. But I think his little experiment uh, <laughs> was poignant because it makes the point that the reason Jesus was washing feet is that it was disgusting, that it was gross. His reason he offered to, you know, to wash their, wash their faces, right? He wanted to wash their feet. And so often what we end up doing is we kind of get pedicures for God before we talk to him. 
Or we say like, hey God, yes, I know you want to cleanse me and forgive me. You can clean my guest bathroom. You can have that part of my life. You can have my virtues and my good qualities and my gifts. When like the whole point of Jesus washing feet is that he wants the dirty parts. He wants everything. That's the whole idea. That's the whole point of it. And so that, again, is the kind of the context of Holy Week that the church, the church gives us. And then, of course, also Holy Thursday is a commemoration of the, the Last Supper, right? You know, the, Jesus instituting the Eucharist one, but also instituting the, the priesthood. Um, obviously, that's close to my heart, but it's good for the church to be reminded that you're not going to ever have the Eucharist if you don't have the priesthood. Um, and that was a big part of kind of my, my story was that I felt like throughout the rest of my life, I was going to want people to give me Jesus in the Eucharist and forgive my sins. And um, we need a priest to do that. And how could I ask other people to give that to me if I wasn't willing to, to give, that, give that for others? And this gift of, you know, the Eucharist, um, we talk a lot about the Mass as a meal, um, which is completely true. The Mass is a meal. But I think it's good to remember that before, you, before we eat anything, we always have to sacrifice it, Right? Um, if you need, want to eat an apple, right, you have to pick it, pull it off the tree, and as soon as it, you, that happens, you cut it off from its life source, and it's going to die. It's dying in that moment um, so that you can eat it. If you're going to go fishing or you catch a fish, pull out of the water, it has to die so that you can then eat it. That's true for all of our meals, um, and so it's true for the Eucharist as well. In order for Jesus to feed us his body, it had to be sacrificed. And in, in most cases, what happens is that we sacrifice the thing and then we eat it. But Jesus actually gave his body to us and then sacrificed, right? So on Holy Thursday, he, he says that he gives his body to the disciples. And then on Good Friday, he shows that he meant it, right? And that's, that sacrifice of himself is what gives us that life. Um, and in most cases, food becomes us right? Like we make the food into us to give us nourishment for our bodies. But when it comes to the Eucharist, we actually become the food, right? God actually absorbs us into himself. Um, and what's kind of amazing about every Mass is that we have, every Mass is a commemoration of the Last Supper. We believe that the Last Supper is actually made present again um, in the Eucharist. But also, um, Calvary is present too, the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. And we also recognize that we have a, a moment that we live in, whatever the current time is, when the Mass is happening, it's happening then too. And also it's a connection with eternity. So that's all those things are happening at every Mass. It's the Last Supper, it's Calvary, it's the present moment, and it's eternity all happening at once. And that's why it's so important for us to be, to really be attending Mass and, and to receive the Eucharist. That's why the Church um, has that in place as, as part of keeping the Sabbath holy. Um, I was talking to a friend of mine the other day, and she's a teacher, and she mentioned that one of her students, he was, I think, eight or nine years old. He told her, hey, Maria, we, we used to be Christians. And she said, you know, you, you used to be? And he said, well, yeah. Um, and she said, well, what changed? He said, well, we, we stopped going to church. We don't go anymore. And she said, well, you can, you can still be a Christian and not, not go to church. And he said, really? You know, we don't go. And he's not really that far off. Like, even at that age, he realized if we're not doing anything about our faith we must not believe it anymore right it's very popular right now to just kind of do religion yourself in your room um, when really what you do says a lot more about what you believe than just what you say right um, and that's why this public celebration of the eucharist why this whole triduum is so important um, because it's publicly manifesting what it is that that we believe i was listening to a preacher the other day and he mentioned how um, in every relationship, you're going to usually have a public aspect and a private aspect to it. Um, so like in a married relationship, for example, um, with like your wife, um, there's a public aspect to it. Um, you have rings and everything, and a private aspect, like a personal intimacy that you have with each other. And if one of those is missing, it's a really, um, it completely destroys the relationship, right? So if you, um, you know, publicly marry your wife and you wear your rings, but you guys have no personal kind of relationship with each other, it's, it's completely empty. Or if you have a very personal, intimate relationship with somebody, but there's no public aspect to it, you don't get married, right? 
there's no accountability there, right? Then you're using the person. And so in the same way with God, there needs to be a, a private aspect, like a personal intimacy in prayer, where it's just us and him working together. But there also needs to be a public side of the worship, a public kind of accountability. And that's why litur liturgy is so important, because it's that public manifestation of our faith. Um, and, and certainly the Eucharist is going to be central to that. My favorite uh, Eucharist story, my, uh, my home parish growing up, St. Paul's in Clear Lake, and there were two, two elderly ladies um, that would sit up at the front, and they would like whisper to each other during Mass, um, but they would whisper so loudly like everybody could hear what they were saying, right? And so uh, one, one Mass, they were there, and they got back after communion, and one of the ladies whispered to the other, I think the priest gave me two wafers. And the other lady whispered back, don't complain, you probably needed it. It was... It was so classic, so classic. Um, so we have that for Holy Thursday, and then next we have, you know, Good Friday, the next, the next day. And I think, one, it's important not to lose Mary when it comes to the passion of Christ. Um, we don't hear a lot about her in the passion, but we know, based on other parts of Scripture, that a lot is happening in terms of salvation for us in what Mary is enduring through the passion. Um, in terms of, like, the way she is with Jesus, faithful to him, loving him, the way her heart is being pierced. Um, and I've actually experienced that even more, you know, as a priest. My, uh, my, again, my home parish at St. Paul's, a lot of people, you know, still ask me to do stuff, like come help with confessions for retreats or take masses and that kind of stuff. And they'll email me or they'll call me. And I try to get back when I can, but my priority is really the parish I'm at now. So um, sometimes it'll be a little while before I get back to them. I get a lot of emails and stuff. And so what do they do if they can't get a hold of me? They call my mom. Always. They call my mom, and my mom calls me, and uh, I pick up when my mom calls, you know, and she says, you haven't talked, called Susan back about the acts, you know, the women's acts retreat confessions. Do you really need to call her back? And yes, mom, I'll call her back, you know. Um, in so many ways, the best way to get to a son is to go through the mom. I mean, it just works. It just works. And I think anyone who doesn't, anyone who doesn't think that Mary is important when it comes to being a follower of Jesus just doesn't understand the relationship between a mother and a son. Like, you just don't get that um, if you don't think Mary was important to Jesus or Mary is important to Christianity. So I think this week is also a really good time um, to make sure that we're praying the rosary, to kind of look, look at the crucifixion through the eyes, through the eyes of Mary in a lot of ways and her investment with that. Um, the main thing I tend to hear as a priest uh, when people kind of encounter Jesus dying for their sins is they often feel completely unworthy of it to the point that they sometimes even kind of reject the forgiveness. They're like, I'm really not worthy of Jesus dying for me. Um, and I appreciate the, uh, the, the form of like humility in that, like I'm not, I'm not worthy of Jesus dying for me. But I always say like, yeah, you're not. That's the point. Like if all of us were really good people, who did good things all the time and our lives were perfect and Jesus came and suffered and died, I think we would be like, hey, thanks for suffering and dying, but like you didn't need to do that. We were fine. Like we were good, actually. Instead, Jesus came and he suffered and he died and we really needed that. And frankly, it wasn't like a great deal for Jesus. Like it wasn't a good deal for him to come and suffer and die so that we could be forgiven of our sins. Like he was not trying to engage in a, in a fair transaction. Um, it was a bad deal for him. But, like, when I was born, baby Abigail, when I was born, my parents didn't love me because I'd earned their love or because I had done something to be worthy of their love. They loved, you know, baby David Michael because he was theirs. That's it. And the reason God loves us is not because we've done anything to be worthy of that love or to earn it, but because we're his. That's it. So that feeling of unworthiness, you know, is maybe a natural one, but it's good to say like, oh yeah, that's the point. That he got to decide if we were worth dying for. He got to make that decision, not us. And I think part of that too as well is like, God has this desire to be a savior and to be a father and to be a healer and those are all things that, those are all relational terms. So I can't be a father unless I have kids, right? You can't be a father without kids. 
So God made us so that he could be a father for us. And he can't be a healer if there aren't sick people. And he can't be, um, he can't be a savior without anyone to save. So I think a big part of the triduum is about telling the Lord, like, okay, if you want someone to find, like, I'll be your lost one. If you want someone to save, like, I'll be someone who needs to be saved. If you want someone to heal, like, I'll be, I'll be sick. Like, to step into that role for Christ, that he can be that for you. And again, so much of it is just coming to him and saying, like, I'll be your lost, I'll be your lonely, I'll be your sick, I'll be your broken. If you'll if you'll be there to save me from all of this. Um, so yeah, just have a, a song about that. I, uh, I usually do this on the piano. We had to kind of change it, so um, I'm having to kind of transpose it, so please be patient. I um, was a chaplain in a hospital, uh, in, well, in a hospital too, but in, in a prison for a while, and I visited with a, with a kid at one, one point um, who, uh, you know, we were talking for a while and he said, they usually don't tell you what they did and you, I, I never would ask, but he said, um, I actually, I killed someone and I just found out today that I'm probably going to be here the rest of my life and I feel so lost. And, uh, so I came back and I talked with him for a while and I came back after that and I, I wrote this song. <laughs> to visit a kid who had grown up too fast. He was locked up, his future defined by his past. I said, man, how are you? Will you be all right? He said, I killed someone and I'm sentenced to life. He said, I know I messed up and I'll pay the cost. But man, I feel so lost. I said, there's a story like that in a book that I read. This guy has some sheep, but one gets misled, so he leaves all the rest. And he searches it down, and he carries it back, and he makes the lost found. There's a story just like that in a book that I read. said his whole life been a bunch of mistakes wrong turn after turn never touching the brakes thought he'd fallen too far sin after sin forgiveness couldn't be for him I said there's a story like that in a book that I read this guy takes his inheritance he wants his dad dead and then he wastes it all till he broken alone but his dad's right back there hoping he'll come home there's a story just like that in a book that I read he said I don't get it how can it be with all my sins who pays the debt for me I said there's a story like that in a book that I read. Henry should have died, but Jesus died instead. And I will always be his, and we're never alone. But someday he'll come back and bring us all home. There's a story just like that in a book that I read. That book's real old, but it still shows the way Cause we're living it every day There's a story just like yours In a book that I read
Thank you. Okay. I need to take this other microphone off, probably. Okay, so Good Friday. Let me find my. I, um, in case you haven't had anyone say it to you, I would definitely recommend going to confession this week. It's a really good time to do that. I'll be in confessions all day on Wednesday at St. Faustina. If you want to come there, um, I'll be there all day long. Um, it's such a, that was the thing I looked forward to most as a priest, um, was hearing confessions. And it has been just absolutely incredible to be there in those moments. Um, to just witness God's, God's mercy and his, his love for people. Um, I, people stress out about going to confession, which I, I totally understand. I do too. I get nervous about it. Um, I still go to confession, you know, regularly. Um, but I think it's good to, to recognize that, like, Jesus already did the really hard part for us. <laughs> like, he suffered and died on the cross. Like, if you think the hard part of your sins being forgiven is you just telling them to a priest— like, then you don't understand what's been done for you. Jesus did the hard part. Coming and just receiving the mercy is definitely the easy part. Um, one of my favorite confession stories, there's a little, little boy came out of confession, and he, um, his mom said, okay, you know, it's your confession, what's your penance? And he said, oh, I'm, I'm really nervous. I don't think I can, I don't think I can do it. And so, well, well, what is it? She said, he said to pray, the priest said to pray three Our Fathers, but I only know one Our Father. <laughs> I was talking to a guy the other day, and he mentioned how um, his mom had been baptized Catholic, but she uh, ended up falling away from the faith and didn't practice for a long time. And then when she was on her deathbed, she had like a quadruple bypass surgery or something and um, was in just horrible pain. And she told him, this is God getting back at me for everything I've done. This is God getting back at me for everything I've done. And when he told me that, I thought, man, I wish somebody had been there to tell her, this isn't God trying to get back at you. This is just God trying to get you back. This is just God trying to get you back. Jesus didn't come down and suffer and die like for revenge on us. He came back, suffer and die, just to get us back to himself. And that's really what this entire the Triduum is for. That's why we're commemorating all of this, is to turn our hearts back to the Lord. Um, so I got another song for you. I, uh, right, pretty soon after the shutdown, you know, we started having masses, uh, public masses, a game where people could come. And um, I, you know, people obviously were, were kind of nervous to come back, and we still weren't really sure what was going on, so it was scary, so... We went from, you know, at St. Faustina, we seat 1,400 people, and usually like the 9 o'clock, 11 o'clock masses were pretty close to that number. We're pretty packed, and we have, we have six masses in a weekend. So we are having just tons of people, so all of a sudden, you know, everybody was distanced out. We didn't have that many, and, um, and it was, it was kind of surreal. And, uh, but I was at the piano one evening, and I said, hey, God, give me a song. Give me a song. And I started kind of messing around, and this is, this is what came. Just a few months ago, this church was packed. So many people we had to adapt. Chairs in the hallways, chairs in the street. Come out as early if you want to see. But things change so fast, things change so soon. And suddenly we have plenty of room. So if you're sinful, please come. All the broken will take them. Hypocrites, we could use some Honestly, we'll take anyone If you've ever wondered If the church had room for a sinner like you Well, these days, we definitely do Just a few months ago, this church was full 
A huge waiting list for a Bible school Maybe then we could choose and decide What kind of people we let inside But things change so fast, things change so soon And suddenly we have plenty of room So if you're sinful, please come All the broken will take on Hypocrites, we could use some Honestly, we'll take anyone If you ever wondered if the church had room For a sinner like you Well, these days, we do But having sinners as members Really isn't so bad Cause the truth is that sinners all this church has ever had We'll take the lost, the weak, the broken, and alone But if you're sick, you can still stay home But if you're just sinful, please come All the broken will take them Hypocrites, we could use some Honestly, we'll take anyone you ever wondered if the church had room for a sinner like you? Well, these days we do. Oh, these days we do. Thank you. I uh, was at the seminary one, one Friday evening. We were all, all together, and one of my buddies had uh, gotten like a weird phone bill with AT&T. And uh, so we were kind of looking through it, trying to help him figure it out. Not a very exciting Friday evening, I know, but we weren't allowed to have girlfriends. So that's the uh, best we could do. And uh, we're, we're going over through his, his phone bill, and he calls the number on the bill, and it's this lady, and she's describing stuff to him, and it sounds like pretty sketchy. So we end up um, finding like another AT&T number online, and we call that one. And uh, we talk to her, and, and like, they're both saying different things. She said he doesn't have a charge on the account. And so we start like, what's going on with them? We're like, hey, let's just have them talk to each other. So we put them both on speaker, and we say, hey, just talk to each other, figure out this. And uh, they kept saying the other person wasn't the real AT&T, but that they were the real AT&T. It's real confusing. And it, it kind of over time, it seemed like the, the bill was, was kind of a scam. And, uh, but it made me think, you know, so often in, in life we might, uh, well, what, what made me nervous actually is the lady, I think, by the end of the call, we started to wonder if maybe she didn't even know that she wasn't with the real AT&T. Like somebody else maybe was, was telling her that she actually was AT&T, and she wasn't. It got me thinking, like, even in life, sometimes we can think we're on the right track or think we're on the right team um, and be kind of kidding ourselves on some level. Um, and Bishop Fulton Sheen has kind of a good litmus test for this. He says that when the Antichrist comes, um, he's going to look a lot like Jesus. The Antichrist will look a lot like Jesus. He's going to um, be very loving toward people. Uh, he'll be very kind to the poor. You know, he'll kiss babies and he'll say the right things and he'll be, he'll be smiling. But there'll be one big difference between the Antichrist and, and Jesus, the true Christ. Um, and that'll be that the Antichrist won't have any scars. He won't know suffering. He won't have any scars. And so I think that's always the test, really, of our, if our love is real, um, is the scars. I said Mass at a a prison a little while back. This was uh, during Advent. And uh, it was really beautiful because I came into prison and the guys, they had a pretty amazing setup. You know, they had an altar there and an ambo and they had like a full band playing all the mass parts. And um, there was a sacristan there who set up everything. And they even had like an Advent wreath. And, you know, they had the three purple candles and the pink candles. And afterwards, the sacristan was putting away the candles and I noticed he had like stuff all over his hands. I said, hey, what happened to your hands? And he said, oh, well, we don't have um, colored candles. All we have is white candles. But I really wanted us to have an advent wreath. 
So every time I use the candles, I, I, I take a marker and I color them, three of them purple and one of them pink. But it doesn't stay on the plastic, so um, when I move them, it gets all over my hands. And I thought, how beautiful is that? To have some marks on your hands as signs of your love. We tend to be so scared in the face of suffering. But I think ultimately, like for me, a question I get a lot of from people, especially young guys discerning priesthood, they'll ask, um, you know, Father, with celibacy, not being able to have a wife and kids, uh, do you get lonely? Do you get lonely or do you kind of just not think about it very often? And I always tell them, um, I love my life. I love my life. I love being able to do what I do. I find so much meaning in it. It's not always easy, but it's, it's always so meaningful and beautiful. And every evening I go to bed at night, you know, grateful that I get to be what I am and that I feel like I've, you know, I've done some good for the world. Um, but I always tell them, yeah, I get lonely. I get lonely sometimes. And frankly, I want to get lonely sometimes. I don't want to die and stand before Jesus and say like, hey Jesus, I had a nice, happy, easy priesthood. Because I think Jesus would say, what? Did you miss it that bad? Like, you missed the entire point of all this. Like I want to stand before Jesus and say like, yeah, I was lonely sometimes. I was lonely with you on the cross and I was lonely with your people and I was lonely for your people. Like, that's what I want to be able to say. And that's certainly what, the way that Jesus lived. Like, if you look at Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane, he's scared. I think that's the accurate word to use. As he's praying about his passion, he's scared. And he even says, like, can you take this cup from me? But then he says, not my will, your will. And in an earlier, earlier portion of the gospel, he says, what am I supposed to say? Father, save me from this hour when it's for this hour that I've come. Like those tough moments in life where we're challenged, we want to escape them, but that's the reason we're here. That's the reason you've come. That's what it's all about. So the key for us in those moments is to always stay faithful. That's what it's about. So that when we die, we show up for God and you have some scars on your hands. That's the only way we'll know if we really meant it. Like when Jesus says, like, was your love real? To be able to say, like, of course it was real. Like, look at the scars. Like, that's really what it's all about. Just a final uh, thought for you guys. Um, I think, you know, on Good Friday, we kind of look at Jesus on the cross and we kind of wonder, okay, like, what, so what should I do in this moment with Jesus on the cross? What should I do? And um, it's interesting because if you look at, um, like, the way the Romans operated, the Roman Empire, you know, these, these, are, these guys were military, focused on, on conquering nations, and they were really good at it. They were really good at building this empire. And there was even this term called the Pax Romana, or the Roman peace, which was... Um, it wasn't really a true peace, but it was basically based on the, the Romans being able to control things and keep everybody where they should be, right? Um, to keep everybody in check. And so one of the ways in which they, they did this, they kind of kept everybody in check, is that if someone um, threatened the empire in any way, um, they, would, they would kill them, right? And they didn't just kill them, they killed them in the most gruesome, painful way possible which at the time was crucifixion. And they do it publicly so that everybody sees. And they're not just killing the guy to get rid of him. They're killing him in that way to show everybody else, don't be like this guy. Don't say that you know him. Don't say that he's your friend. Or you're going to end up like this too. That was the point of crucifixion. That they wanted to kill rebellions. And so this is what happened with Jesus. They thought that he was kind of threatening their power. They heard that he said he was a king. Even people, some people were saying he was God. They publicly torture him so that he'd be abandoned by everybody. 
That was the point, that you would not follow him anymore. So I think the key, one of the beautiful, most beautiful things we can really do on Good Friday is to look up at Jesus on the cross as he's alone there, and he's tortured and he's humiliated, and just say, that's my friend. And I don't really care who knows. Not only is that my friend, that's actually my God. This bleeding, broken man is my Savior. And I'm with him in his suffering because I know he's going to be with me in mine. And I think the hope is that that will be some comfort to the heart of Jesus on Good Friday to know that even when he's abandoned by so many 2,000 years ago and today, abandoned by so many, to at least be comforted knowing that he was loved by you. So those are kind of my, my thoughts on the Triduum. I'll close with one last, last song. Um, I don't mention anything about Easter simply because I think the best way to have a good Easter is to have a good Lent. You don't really need someone to explain to you how excited you should be about Jesus coming back from the dead if you've really internalized um, what his death looks like. If you enter it well into Holy Thursday and Good Friday and Holy Saturday, then you'll know exactly what to do on Easter Sunday. So I have a little song, um, Honor of Easter, a song I wrote about, about heaven. night conversations with your brother are the best they cut through the noise in life a little better than the rest and in one such conversation a question came to my mind hey Brendan what do you think heaven's like he said heaven's like driving down the highway with the doors off in the summer heaven's like late night conversations with your older brother Heaven's like worrying about something, then realizing God already fixed it. Heaven's like Whataburger after 11 when they serve honey butter chicken biscuits. And those are so delicious. Honey butter chicken biscuits. Can I get a witness? Amen. Heaven's like all of this town civilian, plus all of your best friends. And you never have to go home, because the party never ends. No, I don't know if I'm right, but if I had to guess, that's what I'd say heaven's like. Heaven's like setting your alarm early so you can go back to sleep. Heaven's like a warm pair of clothes that mom just got out of the laundry. Heaven's like a good snow cone in Houston when it's hot. Heaven's like a pretty girl telling you that she likes you a lot. Before seminary, before seminary, of course. Heaven's like all this time's a billion, plus all of your best friends. And you never have to go home, cause the party never ends. No, I don't know if I'm right, but if I had to guess, that's what I'd say heaven's like. Christian isn't about trying to make this life perfect. It's about trying to be perfect. Because you know heaven's gonna be worth it. Heaven's like sitting in a church where you know that you belong. Heaven's like watching people smile when you sing them a song. Heaven's like going to a reflection evening with some other Catholics. Come to think of it, maybe heaven's just a little like this. Heaven's like tonight times a billion, plus even more friends. And we'd never have to go home, cause the party would never end. No, I don't know if I'm right. No, I don't know if I'm right. No, I don't know if I'm right. But if I had to guess, that's what I'd say heaven's like. And that's what I'd say heaven's like. You guys for having me tonight. Thanks, Father Phil. Hope you enjoyed it. God bless.
Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Wonderful. Thanks for coming. Let's take his, I'm sure we take his words to heart. And uh, I hope this is a wonderful Holy Week and a triduum to remember. Keep safe. See you. Forgiveness is tomorrow. Actually, it's today, but tomorrow.